it's time for Maths with Mr. Thomas. Alrighty then, chapter 8, lesson number 4, sketching improper rational functions 2. The only difference between this lesson and the last one is the last one we did not have to work out the stationary points. But I wanted to throw in one more example where we do have to work out the stationary points. So this is that example. Examples 1 to 4 are in the previous lesson, so we're starting off with example 5. It's just another example on sketching improper rational functions. This is an exam style question because it's split up into parts A, B, C, D and so on. So, a function is defined by f of x equals 2x squared plus x take away 1 over x take away 1. Part A, find the coordinates of all the points where the graph of f of x crosses the coordinate axes. In other words, where does it cross the x-axis, where does it cross the y-axis? Part B, find the equation of each asymptote. Remember, you get vertical and non-vertical asymptotes, so you have to work out the equation of them. Part C, find the coordinates of each stationary point on the graph of y equals f of x and determine their nature. Part D, Olivia's favourite, sketch the graph of y equals f of x. And for a wee bonus, part E, state the range of values of the constant k such that the equation f of x equals k has no real solutions for x. So let's start this off then with part A. Part A, find the coordinates of all the points where the graph of f of x crosses the coordinate axes. Now we know for that, really, we're wanting to work out where it crosses both the x and the y axes. Where does it cross the y axes, chuka? Good, crosses the y axis when x equals zero. So all you're doing is you're replacing x with zero to work out the y coordinate. So you would have y equals, that works out to be zero plus zero take away one, negative one, zero take away one, negative one, which works out to be one. Therefore, you can say it crosses the y axis at zero, one. Woohoo! Where does it cross the x axis? How would you find that, Tega? Brilliant, that's gonna be when y equals zero. So when y equals 0, well if you think about y as your f of x, that's what y is. So y equals the 2x squared plus x take away 1 over x take away 1. Therefore you can set that fraction equal to 0. Multiply both sides by x take away 1 and you end up with that. Where would you go next, Abby? Factorize. Perfect, you factorise that so you get 2x take away 1 bracket x plus 1 equals 0. And your values then that you would have, Sandy? Uh -huh. Brilliant. And what else? Negative 1. Brilliant. Well done. So you get x equals a half, x equals negative 1. Therefore, you can say the graph is going to cross the x-axis at half 0 and negative 1, 0. High five, people. Part B. Find the equation of each asymptote. So let's first of all think about your vertical asymptotes up and down. So your vertical asymptotes, Megan, when do they occur? Brilliant, they occur when the denominator equals zero. Your denominator here at the bottom, you've got x take away one, so set that equal to zero. That's dead easy, you just get one. Brilliant, so x equals one is going to be your vertical asymptote. However, just remember, you are going to have this vertical line. And what you need to do is you need to think, right, well, what's happening to the graph before that? Because it's an asymptote, you know as it goes on towards infinity, the graph's going to get closer and closer and closer and closer to it, but it's not quite going to touch. So it's either going towards positive infinity or negative infinity. And the same just after it, you need to know if it's coming from positive infinity or if it's coming from negative infinity infinity. And the way you work out that is by investigating what happens at either side of your asymptote. So bring up this funky wee table. You've got x and you've got y. Take your vertical asymptote, that's going to be x equals 1, and go out by one decimal place. So 0 0.9 and 1.1. Sub both of these values into the original equation. So replace x with 0 0.9. If you plug that in, you could be you could work that out in your head or just use a calculator and you want to work out really if you get a positive or a negative value. If you put in 0 0.9, you end up with a negative, which means then that the graph before one is going to be going down towards negative infinity. So your graph will look something like that. It's gonna be going down there towards negative infinity. After one, you've got 1.1, sub that in as well. Do you get a positive or a negative? 
Good, you get a positive. So it means then that after one, so after that line there, it's gonna be coming down from positive infinity. So that is what you would have in there. So those red parts are what you would have for your graph. So that is your vertical asymptote. After the vertical asymptote, what do you then need to think about, Samantha? Perfect, you need to think about non-vertical asymptotes. And for your non-vertical asymptotes, well, if you look at the equation we had at the start, the 2x squared plus x take away 1 over x take away 1, what could you say about that, Daniel? It's improper. Yes, it is improper because the degree of the numerator, the highest power is 2. Here, the degree is 1. The highest power is x to the power of 1. And in that case, if the degree of the numerator is bigger than or equal to that of the denominator, you first have to use algebraic long division to express really your function as the sum of a polynomial and a proper rational function. So you are going to be dividing the 2x squared plus x take away 1 by x take away 1. Therefore, set that out with your wee dividing step. And if you think Dracula must suck blood, D for divide, M for multiply, S for suck, and B for begin again. So divide, first of all, divide the first terms. 2x squared divided by x gives you 2x. Write that just above the x. After that, must m for multiply, so 2x times x gives you 2x squared. 2x times negative 1 gives you negative 2x. After that, Dracula must suck, so you suck, you subtract, so you've got the 2x squared, take away x squared, they will cancel out. If they don't cancel, you've made a mistake. You've got x take away negative 2x, which will become x add 2x, which is 3x, and negative 1 take away 0 is negative 1. After that, do you begin again or do you stop? Perfect, you begin again because you can see here you've got 3x, the highest power is 1. Here you've got an x, the highest power of 1. The degrees are equal. They're both x to the power of 1. So you have to keep going until the degree here is less than that of the divisor. So begin again. Divide. So 3x divided by x gives you positive 3, so you can write that up there. After that, you multiply, so now it's 3 times x, which is 3x, and then 3 times negative 1, which is negative 3. After that, once again, you subtract, so 3x take away 3x is 0, that's what you expect, and negative 1 take away negative 3 is going to be 2. Woo! Therefore, you can say that y equals the 2x squared plus x take away 1 over x take away 1 can be rewritten as, well, just remember this up here is your answer. So that is your polynomial that you put on its own. And then you've also got a remainder. And that there is your remainder. So it's going to be 2 over this x take away 1. We're dividing by x take away 1. We're still dividing by that x take away 1. So it's 2 over the x take away 1. <gasps> What do we do then for the non-vertical asymptotes? Now we have written that. Good, we have to consider what happens if x tends towards positive or negative infinity. Really the key for this is you want to look and see if you have a fraction. If you have a fraction, well we've just got a number at the top, but we have an x term on the bottom. And really as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, what's going to happen is you're dividing 2 by a bigger and bigger number. Meaning it's going to get closer and closer and closer towards 0. This part here with the 2x plus 3, well it means that y is going to equal, it's going to go towards whatever 2x is plus 3. So you can say then that as x tends towards positive and negative infinity, y will tend towards just the 2x plus 3, since the fraction part will get closer and closer towards 0, so you can just dismiss that. So what you would write is, as x tends towards positive or negative infinity, y would just tend towards that 2x plus 3. Meaning then you have a non-vertical asymptote of, and you replace the tends towards with equals. So y equals 2x plus 3 is your non-vertical asymptote. Yeah! Part C, find the coordinates of each stationary point on the graph of y equals f of x, and determine their nature. Bum, bum, bum! It's stationary points. When do stationary points occur? Brilliant! Stationary points occur when dy by dx equals 0. Really, it's the point in the graph of y equals f of x, so dy by dx would equal 0. 
So really we're wanting to differentiate this. If we've got the 2x squared plus x take away 1 over the x take away 1, how do we differentiate that? What would you have to use, Ryan? Good you would have to use the quotient rule. Remember when you have one function in terms of x divided by another function in terms of x, so here it's the 2x squared plus x take away 1, divided by that x take away 1, you have to use the quotient rule. u dash v take away u v dash over v squared. So you've got u and v, u is what is on the top, so the 2x squared plus x take away 1, and v is what's on the bottom, the x take away 1. Differentiate both of them, so u dash will be 4x plus 1, and v dash, if you differentiate that, will just give you 1. Work out dy by dx then, so dy by dx, u dash v, so you've got that x take away 1 times the 4x plus 1, multiply them together, then you are taking away and multiply the 2x squared plus x take away 1 by 1. And that will be over whatever v is squared, so the x take away 1 in brackets squared. Tidy that up by multiplying out the brackets, multiply out the brackets there, that is what you end up getting, and then bring all your like terms together. The denominator through this has just stayed the same. From there again, tidy that up by taking out a common factor. You can take out a common factor at the top of 2x, so you'd have 2x bracket x take away 2 over the x plus 1, x take away 1, all squared. From that, well, you know that stationary points occur when dy by dx equals 0, so you can say the 2x bracket x take away 2 over the x take away 1 all squared will equal 0. If you multiply both sides by x take away 1 all squared, well, that would be 0 times that, which is still 0, and it leaves you with 2x bracket x take away 2 equals 0. Really, if 2x bracket x take away 2 equals 0, set each part equal to 0. So if 2x was equal to 0, well, x would equal 0. And if x take away 2 equals 0, x would equal 2. So we get the stationary points, really, at x equals 0 and x equals 2. However, we are not finished. We have to also find the y values. So you know the coordinate is going to be 0 something and it's going to be 2 something. So to work out the y values, sub the x into the original equation. So when x equals 0, if you sub that into the original equation, well, you end up getting out 1. So you know y would equal 1, giving you then a stationary point of 0, 1. Also, when x equals 2, if you sub 2 into the original equation, when x equals 2, you end up getting 9 for y, which means then you're going to have a stationary point at 2, 9. However, how do we know these are stationary points? What do we need to do? Good. To confirm they are stationary points, you have to use the nature table or the second derivative if you've already looked at that. One or the other makes no difference which you use. So, I'm going to use nature table, using nature tables, because I've got the two values. I've got 0 and 2. So, you've got x, pick a value just before that and a value just after. So, if x was 0, just before 0 and just after. Work out what dy, dy by dx would be and think about the slope. So, if you put a value less than 0, say negative 1, into dy by dx, you end up getting a positive value, which means the graph is going to be sloping up the way. If you put 0 into dy by dx, well, that gives you 0, which means the graph will be flat there. And if you put in a value bigger than that, well, that is going to give you a negative, which means the graph will be sloping down. Do the same thing for 2. Pick a value just before and just after. So if you put a value just before 2 into the dy by dx, you end up getting a negative, which means then the graph slopes down. If you put 2 in, you end up getting a 0, which means the graph is perfectly flat at 0. And if you put in a value bigger than that, you end up getting a positive, so the graph will be sloping up the way. Therefore, you can say that because the graph is sloping up, then it's flat, then it's coming down, then there will be a maximum turning point at that point, 0, 1. And here at 2, well, because the graph's sloping down, then it's flat, then it's going back up again, you know that will be a minimum turning point at 2, 9. So the stationary points, we've got a maximum at 0, 1, and a minimum at 2, 9. Yeah! We have now gathered all the information that we need. I'm going to summarise that here. So we've got it crossing the y-axis at 0, 1. Well, if you just draw your x and your y-axis, and then you can plot a point, 0, 1. But doink If it's crossing the x-axis at half 0 and negative 1, 0, again, you can plot that just on your graph. But doink doink 
and it's got a maximum turning point at zero, 01, so zero, 01. Again, you can just plot that. There is a minimum turning point at 29, so there is your minimum point, just put that in. And the asymptotes as well, your vertical asymptote, draw a vertical asymptote, dotted line, at x equals 1. And the non-vertical asymptote, you have to graph that. That is going to be y equals 2x plus 3. So you've got that sloping line going through 3. From there, once you are happy with that, with your points, with the asymptotes, you then want to start drawing your graph. When you start to draw the graph, again, I always like to start with the vertical asymptotes. So the vertical asymptotes then just before one, so just before this vertical asymptote, and know the graph is going down towards negative infinity. So just before one at 0 0.9, I know the graph is going to be coming down here. So this line here is going to be getting closer and closer and closer to that asymptote, but it's not going to touch. And then just after, on the other side, I know I'm coming down from positive infinity. So it's going to be coming down here from positive infinity. From there, you need to think about the rest of your graph. So what's going to be happening? Well, from here, you know coming down, you know there is a turning point at this 2.9, and that's your minimum turning point. So you know the graph will be doing something like that. Also, because it's coming down from here, well, you know it's just going to join up onto that minimum turning point. And after that, because it's going up the way, well, yeah, it's going up the way, but it's not just going to be doing something like that. You know that this here is an asymptote, so the graph is going to be getting closer and closer and closer to that line. But again, it's not going to touch. Hopefully, you can draw that a wee bit better than I have there. Other parts as well, you know from here, you know it's crossing over this x-axis. So from there, it must be going up through that point. You know that 0, 1 is a turning point, it's a maximum turning point, which means the graph goes up into it and then back down, so it'll look something like that. And really, you should be able to just to join these parts together. From here, coming back down, well, you know it's going through this point, negative 1, 0, so you can draw it going through that point. And again, you know that this is a non-vertical asymptote, so the graph will be getting closer and closer and closer to that line, but not touching. So just put in what you know, start off drawing what's happening with the asymptotes, draw in the bits for the turning points as well, and then join it up. If you do that, that there is what you will have. That there is your answer. There was one extra part thrown in, the part E states, states the range of values of the constant k such that the equation f of x equals k has no real solutions for x. So... We know from this we've got f of x equals k. So we're going to put in different x values and we're going to get out k. Well, you know if you put in different values for x, it's the y values that you are going to find. So you can think of k as the y value. Really, a lot of the time when you have your graph, it's y equals f of x. So f of x equals k in this case, but k is going to be y. So you're going to be thinking about your y values. So you're looking at like your 1, your 2, your 3, your 4, and so on. So you're thinking about all of these y values. And what it's saying is that there are no real solutions for x. Well, you know, for this... You're thinking about the y values, and you know when y is up here, well, there is a solution in the graph. You get two solutions. You know when y is over here, again, you've got a couple of solutions. That's absolutely fine as well. When it's here, again, you've got your solution. When it's way down here, you've got solutions on the graph. So picking these y values, like at negative 1 or whatever, you can see there's two values. But you're wanting to find out where there are no solutions. And you can see that for this part just here, so above 1, going up to just below 9, anywhere there, there are no solutions for y. So if you draw in just a horizontal line below that, you can see that that line is not going to touch the graph. So when y is, say, 8, well, there are no solutions. When y is 7 as well, again, there's no solutions. It's not touching the graph. Or 6, or 5, or 4, or 2, or just above 1. So what you can say from that is the graph shows that the equation f of x equals k has no real solutions when k lies in the interval between 1 and 9. So in other words, when the y value is bigger than 1 and less than 9, there are no solutions for that. It does not touch the graph. That is one extra example on sketching improper rational functions. This time, though, stationary points were required. Try some of the questions in the book. You're on page 44. Check the answers as you go. Best of luck. 
Have fun with that. Bye. Woo!